Okay, welcome everyone. Last set of uh, parallel presentations uh, before we have lunch and then our uh, plenaries. So my name is Rebecca Potter. Um, I'm at the University of Oslo His Center. I lead our work in the health domain. And what this really means is that we're pretty great with DHIS2, but we rely a lot on our public health partners and health partner institutions and others to really help us produce good products and make sure that these are being implemented well in the field to help um, ministries of health and public health programs. So today it's really lovely to be shared, um, sharing the stage with many of my colleagues here. Um, we are a WHO collaborating center since 2017. We work across a number of uh, WHO regional offices, so we're very happy to have the Southeast uh, Regional Office here today. We've been working with the Pan American Health Organization on a number of projects for several years. And just last year, we were actually lucky enough to um, be able to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Caribbean Agency for Public Health. And we have uh, representatives from all of these institutions here today to share a little bit about how they are using DHIS2 to support not only their work, but the way that they support their member states. So without further ado, I'm going to switch the order a little bit today. And, um, oh, I forgot to even mention, we have USCDC here and we have a cooperative agreement with USCDC that's good through 2025. So uh, today we're going to have um, Talia Shrogai from the Global Immunization Division of CDC, uh, joined by Felipe Aguilera Miyakura, uh, to share a bit more about the Pan American Health Organization's implementation of DHIS2 as a VPD surveillance system, um, now labeled VPD Smart. So, Talia and Felipe, it is now the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Rebecca. Again, I'm Talia Shragai from the uh, Global Immunization Division of CDC. I'm here with Felipe Miyakura from the Pan American Health Organization. And we're presenting on the transition to an updated vaccine preventable disease surveillance system for PAHO and the Americas, and talking about lessons learned from implementation of this new system in Paraguay. Um, this presentation was developed in collaboration between PAHO, the CDC, and the EPI of Paraguay. Uh, robust vaccine preventable disease surveillance is very important to maintain healthy populations. Uh, it can help with early detection and response to any outbreaks that might be happening. It can help identify any gaps in immunization coverage in a population, and it helps us make sure that uh, health systems remain healthy. And PAHO has been leading VPD surveillance in the Americas for over 100 years. This shows the flow of VPD data from the subnational level all the way up to the global level from the Americas. Uh, health facilities will report up to subnational levels who will then report to the national level. There are 21 countries and one subregion of the Caribbean that report in the Americas, uh, all of those data up to the PAHO regional office. PAHO aggregates all of the country data and uses them to produce a routine set of reports and bulletins that many countries use to monitor VPDs in their own countries. And PAHO will also report those data up to uh, WHO headquarters to be aggregated into the global database where they form the official global numbers on VPDs in the Americas. The information system used by PAHO for monitoring VPDs has evolved over time. The first digital system for VPD surveillance used by PAHO was PES, shortly followed by MESS in 1989 and 1996 for polio and measles surveillance, respectively. Um, in 2012, PES and MESS were replaced by a new system called ESIS, or the Integrated Surveillance Information System. Uh, not all countries decided to use ESIS. Some use their own proprietary system for VPD surveillance. So in 2014, PAHO introduced an automated data exchange system to integrate data from ESIS and non-ESIS countries. And now in 2024, PAHO is once again in the process of modernizing the information system uh, to a new system called VPD Smart that's based on DHIS2. Like I mentioned in the last slide, not every country currently uses ESIS. Uh, 20 countries are using ESIS as their current uh, VPD surveillance reporting system to the regional level. 
Three countries are using proprietary system, but it's a system where the data is aligned with ESIS data, so they're very easy to integrate. Four countries use a non-ESIS system where the data are not aligned with ESIS, so PAHO has had to create specialized pipelines to combine those data. And then one country, Brazil, uses a mix of information systems. Uh, so why did PAHO decide it was time to modernize the system? There are several reasons. ESIS is based on outdated technology, and even just the maintenance of the system requires a huge amount of time and manpower. Um, ESIS is also not cloud-based, which means it uh, requires a local installation everywhere that's used. And there's no web-based capacity for real-time analysis, which is important for timely response to outbreaks. So PAHO did a search of the options and ultimately decided that a DHIS2-based platform was the best option for replacing ESIS in their new system that they're calling BPD Smart. A few things about, uh, a few important points about the DHIS2 system that PAHO decided to develop. First, PAHO decided to focus um, primarily on measles rubella surveillance and AFP surveillance for polio to start with the idea that in the future they may expand to other diseases. It's designed as interoperable case and laboratory modules. So case data and laboratory data are automatically linked. Uh, by default, all data is stored on a centralized server at the PAHO regional level. So rather than have local installations of servers in countries, by default, countries will report and data will be held at the PAHO regional level. And again, by default, it replaces ESIS for regional level reporting, not country level reporting. So uh, the baseline is for countries to swap out uh, ESIS for just the reporting they do from the national level to the regional level, keeping their reporting system from the health facility to the national level the same, unless there's special interest or capacity to do so. I don't think I need to say why DHIS2 is so great to this room, but a few points. It's open source and user-friendly. There's integrated data management tools for high data quality. There's integrated tools that help use data for action, like automated alerts. Um, there's data analysis and visualization systems that are easy to customize, and it can be made interoperable with other information systems. I keep saying BPD Smart. Um, in addition to the DHIS2 data reporting system that Paho is setting up, this is actually a bigger set of overhauls. So it also includes an update to that, uh, Paho's data warehouse system to a new Azure-based system. And it includes an overhaul of the visualizations and bulletins that PAHO routinely reports. And together, these three updates are the VPD smart system. The new architecture that PAHO has set up for swapping over to DHIS2 accommodates both those countries that will be using DHIS2, and it also allows for countries to continue using their own proprietary system if that's what they'd like to do. So all ESIS using countries are expected to move to DHIS2 those data will go to the PAHO regional server, where they'll then be piped into the um, data warehouse. For non-DHIS2 countries that decide to continue using their own proprietary system, they'll continue reporting as they always have been with data going directly to the data warehouse. Then those data will be combined with the DHIS2 data, where they'll be used for the uh, routine reporting up to the WHO HQ level and for the creation of routine bulletins and reports. The transition to VPD Smart was designed as a series of steps, starting with the development of the beta system for measles rubella and for AFP. Once a beta system was in place, PAHO hosted a series of user acceptance testing workshops for participants to practice using the system and provide feedback. Then PAHO developed their new set of standard reports and visualizations that would be automatically included with the DHIS2 system. They created the new pipelines to move DHIS2 data into their warehouse and combine it with non-DHIS2 data. They created a set of data dictionaries to make sure that data uh, is standardized and a series of user guides to ease the transition for countries. Um, they worked on the migration of historical data from ESIS into uh, DHIS2, and then finishing with pilots of the new VPD smart system in countries. I'm not going to go into every single one of those steps and details, but a quick note about the UATs, because these were really important to getting to a system that everybody was happy with. These were a series of workshops that included country representatives from those countries that would be switching to DHIS2, as well as PAHO regional advisors. Um, and they provided all participants with mock data for to practice using the system itself hands-on. 
So participants could get really detailed and accurate feedback about what worked well and what didn't. And then those feedback were used to improve the flow, the user friendliness, and data quality control measures integrated into the system. PAHO has already completed many of the steps necessary to get to rollout. Um, they are currently working on migration of historical data and have started the process of piloting, starting with their first country of Paraguay. And from here, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Felipe, to talk more about that Paraguay pilot. Thank you so much, Talia. Then I'm going to tell you a bit more about Paraguay's implementation. Um, well, here you can see a brief, I could say, a BP the Smart implementation roadmap uh, that is, even though it's standardized, it can be adapted to the needs of every country. Um, at the beginning, I could say that it includes uh, some steps for system familiarization, data assessment, comprehensive training for key stakeholders, legacy data migration, uh, and ends with a simultaneous BPD Smart and IC ECs data entry. Um, BPD Smart Rollout is also fostering collaboration between key stakeholders within the country, I could say, uh, starting by the expanded uh, immunization program that here is present and represented by Susana. Um, the Central Health Region, the Central Laboratory, and the San Lorenzo Hospital. Uh, this collaborative effort has allowed the country to identify opportunities for improving BPD surveillance, what is quite good from our point of view. An example of this update is the, the update that they did to their official, official investigation form to better align with the system's requirements. And additionally, we have an approach of train the trainer um, to encourage focal points to share knowledge at different administrative levels. Um, there are three main goals for this implementation, I could say. First, migrate Paraguay to a robust and scalable digital platform. Secondly, the, this successful implementation uh, paves the way for a broader adoption of BBD Smart across uh, the Americas. And third, uh, the knowledge sharing. We all know that uh, this is really important because uh, Paraguay's experience could be shared uh, to improve implementations in other countries. Uh, the preparatory groundwork began in November 2023. Uh, this crucial phase involved close collaboration with local authorities to sh ensure a smooth rollout. Um, then later on in March, uh, there were both virtual and in-person training sessions. Uh, to equip participants with the necessary skills to use BPD Smart in the data entry and also in the visualization and analysis. The pilot itself officially launched in April of this year and is currently ongoing. The last two milestones are the evaluation that is stated there without a specific date and the officialization as the nationwide surveillance system for acute flaccid paralysis and measles and rubella that are the diseases that we are are starting with, but not the only ones that are gonna enter in the system. During the pilot data begins its journey at the General Hospital of San Lorenzo, where healthcare workers enter relevant information into BPD Smart. Uh, once entered, the data is submitted to the Central Health Region for validation by designated surveillance personnel, and then is sent to the national EPI uh, program who evaluates and approves for sending the information to PAHO directly. Um, the goal here is to achieve 100% concordance that we are measuring by using three indicators created by the American Society of Immunization Registries. Uh, they are completeness, duplication, and consistency. Of course, we are expecting 100% completeness, 100% consistency, and 0% duplication. As you can see here, the pilot is going really well, I could say. Uh, we have well, even though there are six weeks there, we have seven now. Um, and you can see the improvement on all of these indicators. We are expecting Paraguay to end this pilot probably around August, um, but let's see how it goes. Um, then our next steps in the short term is having a weekly monitoring, as we are doing now, uh, of these three main indicators. At the end of this pilot, when they achieve 100% concordance, we are going to have the evaluation together with the country, and then the BPD Smart rollout in the whole country. 
uh, to finally officialize and substitute the current system ECs for BPD Smart. Uh, in the medium and long term, I would say, Paraguay wants to move towards direct interoperability with their own health information system that they are deploying across the country, and the electronic vaccination registry and some others like the laboratory information system to gather the, the test results directly from their platform. Future expansion of BPD Smart, uh, I could say that we have a standardized a process to migrate legacy data from our current EC system uh, safely extracted with Python from our SQL servers, I could say, uh, and import, import them into DH, the DHIS2 database using Python. Um, then the data is later moved back into PAHO headquarters and data warehouse, which in the future, hopefully, will be based on SQL Azure. Um, this slide showcases an example of successfully migrated data from Paraguay, Barbados, and Chile. While Paraguay's data volume appears larger, this reflects the extensive data recovery effort undertaking uh, together with the country. Our collaborative approach identifies inconsistencies that were at, in the legacy data that were addressed by checking the original investigation form one by one. Then this is a great effort to, done by the country. Um, and is ensuring that uh, the data is integrated successfully into the new system. BPD Smart expansion is gaining momentum, actually. Uh, building on the successful pilot launch uh, by Par in Paraguay, Uruguay is poised for implementation. Uh, also, the Dominican Republic is a prime candidate to lead the way in the Spanish uh, speaking Caribbean countries, while Barbados, on the other hand, will be the first English speaking Caribbean nation to join. Chile is also slated for future BPD Smart implementation due to its interoperability capacities. And finally, we are really grateful for the exceptional collaboration that is making BPD Smart a total success within the region. This initiative involved a dedicated team of experts from PAHO CIM Information System Team, the PAHO Advisory Team, the EPI Paraguay CPI Program, the CDC, the UIO DHIS2 Team, and his Colombia. Uh, as you may imagine, many more valuable partners have contributed into the development of this system. And well, we are working hard to make it work because we are actually improving the surveillance capabilities across the Americas. Thank you. So actually, uh, we're doing so good on time. We do have time for any questions uh, while we get set up for the next presenter. If there's anyone in the audience, please feel free. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Shah Nawaz from WHO country office, Islamabad, Pakistan. Uh, we are using some information system that's locally developed uh, MIS for VPD surveillance cases in, in our country. And this is basically individual level case investigation forms collection system. Uh, we have developed mobile applications for that, but we are ha having challenges again, the duplications of the data, uh, paper and electronic both. But the big challenge we are facing that is the uh, connectivity of the laboratory with these main cases. So I need to ask your experience, especially uh, the laboratory results uh, in, in the same database or same existing record. How, how, how you feel it? Is it uh, user-friendly, convenient, or maybe how, what is the acceptance of the laboratory for this system? Thank you. That's a really good question, I would ask. Say, uh, well, in the case of Paraguay, that is the example that we have. Uh, actually, for them, has been easy. I could say maybe not that easy, but still, um, they have an internal flow where the uh, the laboratory send information every day. I could say the, all the, of all the samples that have received and send all the results, and they have an internal ID uh, that they they can use for matching the cases with the uh, laboratory results, then that is not much of an issue. Uh, there are some other countries that could have uh, those issues because 
they don't have national ID, but mostly in the Americas, most countries have uh, a national ID that you can use for identifying every person with their best results. And at least that's not much of an issue. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to add something to that, Tali. Yeah, sure. Um, so in the case of Paraguay, I think it's manual entry from their laboratory system into DHIS2. And then once it's manually entered into DHIS2, then it's automatically linked to its case entry in DHIS2. But what Paraguay has not done yet is created an automated linkage between their laboratory information system and DHIS2. So there is that requirement of manual entry. So that would be a future step for Paraguay and maybe other countries that would want to do the same to create an automated linkage between any proprietary laboratory system and DHIS2 so that no one has to do that manual entry. But that's quite a bit of work to make that happen, as I'm sure you've understood from your own experience. Um, so I think it's something in the future to work towards. Okay. Well, thank you both. Uh, I actually personally have had the pleasure of being able to follow this project quite a bit from afar, and I definitely encourage anyone here to, to seek out uh, Talia, Felipe, Pajo team. I think we also have Paraguay represented here. Is that right? So um, their lessons learned, I think, are actually really brilliant for any country, any region uh, that's really trying to transition and modernize a system. And there's really a lot of work that goes into that. Um, so congratulations, but also thank you so much for sharing the practical lessons learned. Next, it is my pleasure to um, invite Ruchita, Dr. Ruchita Rajbandari um, with the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. So as I had mentioned, uh, we have a collaborating center agreement with WHO, but we find it critically important, um, these relationships uh, with his groups and also with WHO regional offices, who are um, very much that front line of support for their member states. And uh, we're delighted to have you here to share some of your perspectives on how DHIS2 is supporting member states in your region. So let me pull up your... Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Ruchita Rajmandari from WHO Regional Office for the Southeast Asia region, and I'll be sharing our perspective on strengthening health information system and the DHS2 implementation. And one second. Oh, thank you. All right, so the Sierra region has 11 countries, and we do like to say that even though we have small number of countries, 25% of the world population does reside in our region. We have Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Indonesia, DPR, Korea, Myanmar, Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Timor-Leste. I'm tell I, mean, I have to name these countries just to for you to understand the context and the diverse context we're working with. And how do I move this? Okay. So with, with this diversity has its own ups and downs when it comes to public health gains. For instance, our region has high burden of TB, where more than 45% of TB, global TB incidence is in the region. The probability of dying from major NCDs among 30 to 70 years old is unacceptably high at 21.6. And nine of the 11 countries are not expected to meet the SDG target of 3.4.1 of one third reduction of probability of death. And also in the graph above, you can see that we do suffer from high burden of malnutrition among children under five. We not only have high prevalence of stunting and wasting, but we're also seeing increase in overweight under children under five. However, despite all these challenges, we are focusing more on patient-centric monitoring to support the management and care over the life course approach. And at the, as the health information system, a unit at the CRO, how we are working to strengthen country health data, data system is to enable them to start monitoring the health related SDGs and also to build a health system resilience. And we're doing this through our WHO score uh, framework. The score framework has the five key intervention where the SCO, which I'm sure Anne is going to talk a little later about a bit more, 
where we focus on survey the CRVs and optimizing routine health to improve the data availability and quality, while the R&E, which looks at the review and enabling data used for a policy, looks at enhancing synthesis, analysis, access, and use of data. So through this framework, we provide a technical supports to our member states. I have to be better at this, okay. In 2018, 2020, um, WHO conducted a global score assessment and here's the result. The one on your left would be for the 189. For some reason, the graph is not appearing right here, but it doesn't matter, okay. So one on the left, there's five bars for S-C-O-R-E. The one on the left is the result, which is one, four, seven, 10, and 13, is the result for the score, um, is for the 189 countries that participated in the score assessment. While one, the bars on the right are for the results for the 11 zero countries. So what we see for the survey here is that our countries do have well developed to sustain uh, moderate capacity. What we want to see is we want to see our countries being dark green like this, where everyone has a sustainable capacity. That's what we're moving to. But when we come to the C, the O, the R, E in the Southeast Asia region, we can see our countries are very varied in their capacity. We have countries with well to develop, uh, well to moderate developed capacity, and we do have some countries with nascent and limited capacity. So when we see this, we have to realize that we can't give one approach of technical assistance to our country. Rather, they have to be very country-specific, country-focused TAs. And similarly, in the context of DHIS2, among our 11 countries, eight are using DHIS2 as the national HMIS. And again, the DHIS2 use as well as the implementation varies widely in our countries. However, despite the maturity of a country's system, we do see this common gaps and challenges in all our countries, if not all, at least in most of our countries across these major areas. One is that they lack data quality assurance. Private sectors are not always well captured. There's weak hospital reporting for cause of deaths, quality of care, community service delivery, there's poor analytical capacity, poor disaggregated data. We've heard a lot of this. There's vertical disease program systems, single topic facility survey, lack of interoperability between system and main HMIS, many indicators leading to burden in reporting to health workers, and duplication and inefficient system in key inputs. So it's important for us to understand what these major challenges and gaps are. As we work with our countries, in strengthening their health information system, we also hope to close these gaps and challenges while we address them. So now I'm gonna just, uh, so I talked about the problem statement. So I'm now going to talk about what are we doing to support our countries? How are we supporting them? So first is we conduct regional workshop at least every one to two workshop a year where we want to inform our member states about the best practices the global tools that are available, the standards, the international standards to strengthen the HIS. So recently in April, 2024, in Paro, Bhutan, we conducted a four day regional workshop with our, where we brought together for the first time four program areas. We had dengue, we had MNCH, we had immunization and NCD group to foster this technical interaction between HMIS and program areas. And the objective of the workshop was for the countries to review and prioritize to improve scalable and sustainable RHIS to meet global needs. And the outcome, and we had about 108 participants and 10 of the 11 countries participated in this workshop. And the outcome of this workshop was, we think at least, we, uh, countries were better informed for enhancing the collection management and dissemination of quality assured RHIS data they were able to gain better understanding of harmonized approach to align RHIS indicator with national and international framework standards and tools. And also we, uh, countries were capacitated in the analysis, presentation and use of facility data in decision-making in facility districts and national level. So this is one way we provide TA. And now I'm gonna talk about country specific case study, taking Maldives and Timor-Leste as an example. So Maldives is a country with a pretty well-developed capacity and, they, we, and WHO works very closely with Ministry of Health Maldives in strengthening their DHIS2, which is their HMIS platform. So DHIS2 is used in Maldives as an aggregate level and at tracker level. 
For aggregate, it's the routine health information system where we collect data on outpatient care, inpatient and bed occupancy, lab and diagnostic services, and for public health activities. While the eight trackers are focused on life course over approach over the public health information management with DHS2. So of the eight trackers, four are already implemented, the electronic immunization registry, the PHC registry, the national cancer registry, and the lymphatic polarisis surveillance, they're already implemented and ongoing. And the remaining four, we are on the pilot stage. But as WHO, we just don't work with MOH just to build the data uh, systems. That's not where we stop at. We want to make sure that our countries are capacitated so there's that ownership from the ministry with, for the data systems. So these three areas that we are focusing on capacity building in Maldives is data visualization and use for decision makers, data analysis and visualization for mid-level health managers, and also for DHS to design and customization for developers. Now I'm going to give you a country a specific case study from Timor-Leste. While Maldives was at a very well-developed capacity, I would say, Timor-Leste is a fairly new country who just gained independence about 20 years ago. So keeping that in mind, the kind of technical assistance we provide Timor-Leste is very different. We do a lot of hand-holding while also building their capacity parallelly. So in uh, Timor-Leste in, in 2013, DHIS2 was recommended as a national HMIS known as TLHS, TLHIS. By 2020, all districts have implemented DHIS2 with over 600 users. And in the last four years, WHO has been working closely with the Ministry of Health, Timor-Leste, to develop trackers such as the immunization tracker for the public health campaign or for de-warming activities. And here's an example of TLHIS, DHIS2 data flow. In a country like Timor-Leste, it's very straightforward. We have primary health. We have this, that's the primary health centers, which reports to community health center. There's very few private clinics, maximum five. That does, uh, that, and that also does a lot of traditional uh, medicines. And then we have the 13 district health hospitals, and then we have HMIS department. And from the hospital side, we have the five referral hospitals. Then we have one national hospital, which reports to the directorate for hospital, and that reports to HMIS. Not every country's data flow is this simple, but this is how we are leveraging. And in addition to that, Ministry of Health had requested WHO to develop a HMI Strategic Action Plan 2024-2030 because there's a lot of interest in strengthening HIS, not just from the Ministry of Health, but also from partners. So WHO with CHISU developed an HMI SAP, which was launched early this year. The vision of the SAP was by 2018, 2028, Timor-Less HMIs will be highly performing in terms of generating high quality data and serve as an integrated data repository for effective data use. So additionally, in the SAP, we've laid out for six years key activities and interventions with costed plan. And the Ministry of Health has committed that for their annual work plan, they will take it from SAP. And not only just that, when the donor comes for strengthening health information system, they will be referring to the SAP for their, uh, for their priorities for the intervention. So this is an integrated way on where, where we can provide technical assistance to Timor-Leste. But not only do we stop there, but we also want to enhance or capacitate our Ministry of Health to start using data. And we do this by, we've started by making very simple dashboards. For example, there's a dashboard on monitoring EPI, monitoring maternal um, deaths in health facility. We really don't want them to be scared of data. We want to actually empower them to understand data how do you use data for daily decision making? So that's one thing we're really working closely with our Ministry of Health, Timor. And now that I showed you what kind of assistance we're doing, now is the time to talk about how are we providing this assistance? And this is by leveraging on our HISP Asia hub to strengthen DHIS to implementation. So our region is very lucky. We have a lot of HISP experts in our region who understands the country context, who works very closely with the Ministry of Health, who works very closely with WHO and other partners to provide that um, technical assistance in strengthening DHS to implementation. So I'm just going, so this year uh, we have planned that we will be providing a parallel technical assistance 
to six of our countries in close collaboration with HISP Asia over these three areas. So first area will be, we will be supporting in core essential DHIS2, the HMIS assistance. For here in this, we'll be supporting countries with DHIS2 maturity assessment. We will be supporting with DHIS2 version upgrades. And also countries have asked, we just don't want maturity ass assessment anymore. We want something a little more. We want to start understanding our data architecture. Not every country has a simple data flow like Timor List. There are countries like Bangladesh with really complex data architecture and flow. So they want us to help them map them. And this is what we'll be doing. And countries have also requested for training and capacity building on server administration, database administration, performance tuning for both application and database, API integration, data analytics in use, and these are the training requests that not HISP or not WHO has created. These actually came from Ministry of Health who requested directly to us. And we've, we'll also be providing a specialized DHIS2 technical assistance. I'm just giving example of two, but we have a lot more here in our countries. So for instance, for Bangladesh, we'll be supporting with development and implementation of ICD-11 based morbidity app. Timor-Leste has a school health project going on, which where they're rolling out a comprehensive PHC package for monitoring and assessing immunization coverage, um, deworming activities, screening for eye health, oral health, malnutrition. So we will be working with HISP to develop this interface in TLHIS for data collection. So all in all, we, the whole purpose of us creating this parallel technical assistance at the end, our core goal is we want to capacitate and empower our Ministry of Health that not that not only can do they have ownership of the data, but rather they trust and they use the data for decision making, for policy and planning. That would be the ultimate goal at the regional level here. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Rachita? I just want to thank you, Ruchita, one, for the relentless focus on why we build these systems, which yeah. is to support the data use. Exactly. It can get very easy to uh, get lost sometimes in our architectures and our data flows and even looking at it, reporting uh, exactly. completeness and timeliness. So thank you for that, but also particularly for showing us a model of how HISP and WHO can partner together to respond to these um, country technical assistance needs. Thank you. So next, also a particular uh, thank you to um, Dr. Darren Robinson, who uh, generously agreed to switch order in the presentations here. Um, so Darren is going to share with us the use of DHIS2 at the Caribbean Public Health Agency for Disease Surveillance. And we are thrilled as of, was it this year or is it the end of last year to now have entered into a, a memorandum of understanding? So that's right. It was end of December. Wait, so welcome, Darren. What am I doing? Is this on? It should be on. All right. Hi, good morning. All right. All right. Hi, good morning, everyone. As she said, I am Darren Ramsden. And there's another name on, the, on that slide. Uh, Sheena De Silva is my co-worker and co-author who is not here. Um, and the title of, of the presentation is Using DHIS2 in Communicable Disease Surveillance at CARFA, the Caribbean Public Health Agency. So, um, right. So who are we? Who, who, you know, CARFA, right? So our agency and our department. So I'm going to give a, a talk um, primarily from the perspective of my own department, which monitors communicable disease surveillance. Um, so CARFA is a public health agency serving 26 member states in the Caribbean region. Uh, it was founded in 2013 as a merger of five pre-existing institutions, uh, one of which was the was CARIC, the Caribbean Epidemiology Center. Um, and our department, the HCE department, uh, stands for HCE stands for Health Information, Communicable Disease, and Emergency Response. And it's a department within the Surveillance Disease Prevention and Control Division, primarily responsible for surveillance. Uh, related to communicable diseases. And in general, we conduct 
routine surveillance based on epidemiological weeks, uh, which typical which run from Sunday to Saturday. Right. So here are our member states. Um, you know, so the 26 member states are listed here. Um, people, when they hear Caribbean, they generally think islands. But if you are very good at geography, you could look at this list and identify three of these countries are not, in fact, islands. All right. OK. All right. So um, what kind of surveillance we do? In general, we do both routine and event-based surveillance. And I'll go over three of our routine surveillance programs. And, and also, I'll mention that we have an, one event-based surveillance program, which is that we have a communicable disease outbreak database. Right. So the following slides will go through each of these of the three routine surveillance programs. So, um, so we can move. Right. Okay. So, um, weekly syndromic surveillance. I would say that this is our major surveillance program, and um, of our twenty six members, we get data uh, consistently from seventeen or eighteen countries. Right. So how do, how does this program work? It it works as such that our countries submit country level weekly totals for six standard syndromes listed on the slides, fever and respiratory symptoms, uh, influenza-like illness, gastroenteritis, undifferentiated fever, fever and hemorrhagic symptoms, uh, fever and neurological symptoms, right? So this data is collected at the facility level. It's aggregated in, in, you know, in most cases up to at least one subnational level and then to the national level, and then the national epidemiology unit submits that data to CARFA, right? And how, how we use it in the HC department is that when this data comes in, we analyze it, we have some methodology that we implement in some software that we have, and we try to detect what we call our aberrations. So an aberration might be, um, a, an aberration is, char is characterized by uh, an upsurge in the recent past. So if, if, if there are more cases than have been building up, and also, if we determine that it's unusual for that time of year, right? So we have some software that does that, right? And then, um, as necessary, we also use this form to collect other data. Um, you know, there's levels of coverage, uh, site reporting. And recently, for instance, we started to ask countries to submit some COVID-19 cases so we could monitor that. All right. Our second... Uh, surveillance program is our SARI ARI Sentinel surveillance program. So it's a Sentinel surveillance program. We get countries submitting data from hospitals, right? So we have 16 hospitals uh, distributed over nine of our member states. And the data is submitted by the national level office on behalf of the facilities. Um, and I don't know if you, if, if you can read it, but the data is generally related to the totals, you know, cases, or um, other measures uh, primarily related to respiratory infections, but also some general hospital statistics. So, we, so, so we'll get the number of hospital admissions, um, you know, the number of, of, of respiratory infections, of, of admissions related to respiratory infections, et cetera. And we have it broken down by age groups. So the hospitals would submit these counts, right? And we also, and then the, the third program that I'll mention, um, it's just that we do this. All right, so sorry, our, I, I may have mentioned it was on a weekly basis. Then we have on a four weekly basis, we ask the countries to submit to us total uh, lab confirmed cases of a large number of pathogens, 59 different pathogens. We, in, and, and we ask them to submit the totals um, by age group and, and by sex, whether male or female, right? And um, the reason we asked for it for every four every weeks, because at, at some point in the past, um, you know, it was decided that the process was too onerous to get it on a weekly basis. So we settled into this process where, you know, we asked for it every four weeks. All right. So prior to DHIS2, what did we do? So typically, we would receive this data via email. So we have some Excel spreadsheet forms, templates, and the member states would send it to us via email, and someone on our staff would enter it into whatever we had created, right? So uh, typically, it was a Microsoft Access developed front end because Microsoft Access was our 
was our choice of 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 data storage in almost all cases. Uh, we have, there's one other case where we use another relational database to store something, but that was it, right? And for data storage, uh, we maintained separate databases, typically in Access. But one case of using Postgres, right? But um, but we maintained separate access, and it was um, maintained by someone on staff in the surveillance team and the system, right? Um, and oh, so I should also mention that in general, these surveillance programs. So I, I said that um, you know um, that Kafa was the merger of pre-existing institutions. Some of these programs, all of these programs actually originate even from those days. So even the systems, meaning the software and the hardware, um, the software definitely predated Kafa and even some of our hardware that we were using was from the, from the very early days of Kafa, if not before, right? So, um, and, and the traditional model was that the surveillance group did a lot of the database maintenance and the, all this stuff was kind of invisible or away from of the agency's IT department, right? And then for data analysis and reporting, we had a combination of standard reports and ad hoc analyses that we would do. Um, recently, we've been using R in the last couple of years. Um, uh, in particular, we use um, our Shiny apps, our scripts. Um, then we have some Excel, you know, for doing ad hoc analyses. And previously, um, prior staff would have used SPSS and Stata. Okay, so our approach to migration. So what we did was, um, in, 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 the, in the first stage, we contracted some external consultants to replicate existing data capture instruments. Um, since then, varying degrees of modifications have been made, right? But for the most part, but we started with um, some some forms being implemented by some external consultants to replicate our pre-existing data capture instruments. Data migration, uh, what we, we automated data migration using R scripts or Shiny apps that converted all, all our SQL queries from before. So we sat down and we figured out, okay, if we wanna move all of syndromic surveillance, what we, you know, we reduced it to, okay, we need to run these three uh, SQL queries to get all of our data out. We pull it out, and then we have an R script with mapping all of the data elements, all the category option, category option combos, et cetera. And we moved it into a CSV file and then just use the data import app to import all of our data, right? Um, and data analysis and reporting, what we did, we had to do an audit of all our existing reports and try to compile a list of the functionalities to be replaced. And then we had to figure out, okay, how do now now we have to create a drop-in replacement for any query we might have had to the previous database, right? So we did a little audit. And for the most part, anything that was a SQL query, we basically created a, um, a replacement pivot table uh, in DHIS2, right? And a couple other things. Right? Okay, so where are we now? Right? So for data capture, for weekly syndromic surveillance, we have our member states are, are typically logging into DHIS2 and entering the data. There's no more emails. For weekly uh, sorry, RE surveillance, um, one of our member states is entering data into DHIS2 uh, directly, and we intend to move the others, well, some of the others. Sorry, RE um, has a has a wrinkle in that some of the countries um, don't submit the standard form. They send us something that they have, right? So they have some internal process and they just send it to us. So for the countries that are using their own thing, we're gonna have to try to figure out how to move their stuff you know, efficiently, right? And then the four weekly lab data, it's still by, via email. Um, and but transfer into direct data entry from DHIS2 is contingent on our review of what we want the form to be. So we don't want to, you know, have people move to DHIS2 and then change the form um, subsequent to that. And for data storage, um, you know, we take it for granted, but DHIS2 is now our, our single data storage platform. 
Um, uh, and then for reporting and analysis, uh, DHIS2 feeds all of our downstream processes. And in addition to that, we're also using, um, we also get in some reports, some visualizations from DHIS2 that we didn't have before. Okay, right, so, and here's a screenshot. So, you know, it's not complete fiction, right? Okay, all right. So, and then, yeah, so, and then here's another program that's been enabled by DHIS2, which is daily syndromic surveillance. So previously we were doing only weekly syndromic surveillance. And when, and it's, and when I say that countries submit weekly, that's a simplification, right? Um, countries have a lot of operational difficulties. Sometimes we get data late. We have issues about data quality. And when we talked, when we tried to engage our member states on how to improve the process of them generating this national level number, there's a lot of issues. But if we ask them, uh, can you identify some facilities that can provide high quality data? The honest answer to that is usually yes. Or yes, if we had something like DHIS2. Uh, even if they don't say it in those terms when, when we talk about their problem. So what it is, so now what we're doing is we've created a daily syndromic surveillance data set. And we, we ask countries, you know, if, can you identify facilities that can report on a daily basis? And, and two countries have taken us up on this thus far. One, one country has agreed, well, has, has started using the generic form that we made. The other country said, well, we have a more detailed form with more syndromes, more age groups. And we said, okay, we'll implement your form in the, um, in the HIS2. So these two countries have been using it. Um, I just want to mention there's a Cricket World Cup going on in the Caribbean right now. And that was the catalyst for some of them wanting to do enhanced surveillance. So we'd been offering it, and be, but because there was this mass gathering, gathering event in the Caribbean, they took us up on it, right? So our, our plan, and uh, so this is a list uh, made up before I came to this conference. So, um, well, so yeah. So the other thing we wanna do is we wanna move our existing communicable disease outbreak database. We have a database going back to the 1950s uh, based on data from the literature as whatever, but um, it's it's the last thing we have in Microsoft Access that we want to Im implement it as a DHIS2 event program. Um, and then I mentioned that we detect aberrations on a weekly basis. It's probably two or three aberrations, which causes us to like reach out to countries. Turns out we don't actually write down the aberrations at all. So, you know, we want to keep our log. Of, of what the aberrations were and what the results of any communication with the countries were, right? So other surveillance activities, I'll just mention, you know, CARFA is a, CARFA as an agency is much wider than our department. Um, so known to me at the time of su submitting this presentation, uh, our non-communicable disease department is, is using DHIS2 to collect uh, NCD indicators data set. Um, it's aggregate data to be entered by designated persons in the ministries of health across our states. Um, um, and, and, and then there's some data which would be computed from data sets that we happen to have within CARFA, including mortality data for our member states. And then our vector borne diseases department uh, has implemented a site inspection event program. All right. Okay. So I'll, the benefits that we've received from using DHIS2. Uh, general higher quality surveillance. Um, data capture has been simplified and is now more flexible, right? So we've removed at least one level of data transcription, sometimes two. Um, and then now, 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 now it's more flexible. So if a particular country has a different SARI reform, we give them a different SARI reform, right? Database administration and other IT tasks are less demanding on the surveillance team. So that opens up our time to, to do other stuff. Um, easier access to data for agency staff. And I mean that to be, so there was a kind of bottleneck. When we had the previous database, relatively few people within the agency could access the data. So there would be a lot of data requests coming to our team and not just our team, but to one or two people in our team from everybody in the agency to get data. Um, I would have to say onboarding the country personnel has gone very smoothly. 
um, you know, we have like a one hour Zoom call, we do a training, we give them some slides and everything works. Um, we have better consolidated reporting across all of our programs. We don't need to, you know, bring stuff from different places. Um, uh, the visualizations have, have improved our ability to look at the data. Uh, the pivot tables have functioned as a drop-in replacement for all of our SQL queries. We've had to make a few minor changes to the input for some of our, our applications, our scripts, et cetera, but nothing major. And we're looking forward to interoperability with CMS who are using appropriate um, information systems, right? We 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 have identified uh, some member states. Uh, okay, I'll I'll say four. Um, yeah, that we're looking forward to doing some data exchange to like make this automatic. Three of whom are using DHS two, and one is using another. Right. So benefits to the CMS are that well, submitting data is easier, um, but Two, they can see their data at a higher granularity than before. Uh, three, they're implicitly leveraging DHIS2's data management capabilities. So anecdotally, I can tell you that before we were using DHIS2, we were getting requests sometimes from the countries. They were saying, can you send us our data from 2014 or whatever, right? Because they have something come up and it turns out that they don't have a good system to retrieve it. Right, so now they have access to their own data, right? Um, so yeah, those two things. And now people are also telling us that they're using DHIS too, you know. So they started with just a dashboard, or you know, now they're asking, okay, well, I saw that you use this. I I I I figured out how to make this dashboard. We are using these graphs or these tables generated from DHIS two in our own in-country reporting. Right, and then as I said before, uh, DHIS two for two countries thus far has facilitated high quality uh, sentinel surveillance um, at a higher frequency than we were doing before. So previously, we you know our thinking was weekly is more practical than daily, and that is not always the case, right? Because if you're recording something weekly, you have to keep track of the days anyway somewhere right so if if you give people a good way to to record for the more frequent period you get the larger period for free right and then the other benefit is um you know countries are using CAFA's dhis2 as an instance it's effectively a pilot project for their own implementation perhaps right okay all right and lessons learned well i would say develop use sops um we have a lot of stuff we were doing kind of on an ad hoc basis that looking back now is kind of causing some things we have to clean up, right? So everything from like user administration and how we design things and whatever, right? Um, I would say we need better communication among the DHIS2 users in our, in, 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 in our agency. And I think that's tied into the SOPs. Um, user administration is key. You know, I mean, it sounds really simple now that you figure it out, but like, you know, the whole idea, because I don't think we had a formal training in it. And now we've resolved that, okay, now we use user groups to control access. We use user roles to decide what apps people should see. Um, and that's something that we kind of had to figure out, you know, on our own. Um, user phased approach to migrating surveillance programs, you know, developing using a test instance. Um, then we use it in parallel with the existing solution. Um, you know, first we restrict usage to internal staff. And then eventually, um, you know, we we decide on, you know, one or two countries that we could try having it, um, that we can have try it for a while, and and then we move to the, our larger audience, right? Um, naming is very important. I would say, I mean, that might be a like a more technical thing, um, but you know, we try now to have the name tell you exactly, you know, unambiguously what a thing represents and what it is. Uh, even to the point, like, is it telling you if it's a category or a category option, for instance, naming is very important and themes in it, right? And, the other, um, and then, you know, we've learned that it's really powerful to teach our users to access the data. Um, in the beginning, we were thinking about it as like, okay, they're just replacing their e this email process, right? And we just giving them a login and they're coming in. But we really get buy-in 
when they see DHIS2 as something that they can get their own data out of, they can make their own visualizations and, and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, three, um, uh, then the next thing is, I would say avoid clutter, think carefully about your categories, options, combinations, metadata access. Now we have a system where people are seeing things that they can't get, but they could see and it's just confusing them, right? So even like having extra apps that, that, they, that that's not applicable to them is confusion, right? And then the last lesson I, I would say that we learned is more frequent surveillance is not necessarily more difficult. And in fact, it it is easier in some of our use cases, right? So DHIS2 is, you know, the ability to aggregate data we cannot take for granted. And when I say aggregate is along two dimensions, like both in terms of the org units, but also in terms of time, right? So, um, you know, that's built in and we have to take advantage of that. And that's it. And... Sorry. So much, Darren. Any questions? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, just, I really like when you said, you know, the engagement and get the, all the members that's on board is like smooth. Can you share that experience? Because of implementation, that is one of the most challenging to get everybody on board and sharing the data. So what make it so smooth um, in the region? Uh, so what I say smooth, um, onboarding, um, well, what make it so smooth? I don't know. It, it we it so um we had a process so it was very bureaucratic. Um, I don't know. It's being recorded. So um <laughs> so, <laughs> but we have this process where we actually had to write our executive director had to write to the ministries. They had to nominate people, and you know, and and there was an approval process, and you know, we had to create accounts for certain people making, but um you know, once the list of people. Um, we got it. In some cases, the, it, we didn't get the right list of people. So some cases, um, you know, people were kind of avoiding it, honestly, I, I think, right? Uh, people are like, oh, this is another Kafa thing, right? So, you know, give it to him or her or whatever, right? Um, but when once we figured out who the person would be, like once we identified the correct person to like be entering the data, it, yeah, I I don't know why um i think it's because the in-country personnel um you know generally have a you know a real sense of duty and and you know they see the importance of their work but yeah we, we just you know created the accounts for instance we gave everyone like an initial dashboard we had like a you know a one hour zoom training how to do it um you know people were asking about data yeah people just keep coming to us and asking us how to do more stuff I, I I I don't know if I could tell you why, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, thanks for that presentation. I want to ask about the data migration process Ooh. that you made sound very easy in your case. <laughs> <laughs> but our experience has been very difficult and requires a lot of uh, manual work and a lot of um, cleaning and transformation. Was there any of that involved in your migration process? Um, okay, so. Um, we didn't, uh, so the one thing about our, our, our access database is that it's extremely well designed and it's probably not as, our, our data is probably not as complex as yours, right? So we have, um, you know, it, it's coming straight off a form that allows no deviation from like the requirements. Um, I wouldn't say, well, so what we did was, so, so we had some consultants that created some forms for us. And we went and we entered data into the forms and then we exported it and saw the format, right? And so if, 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 if I put the number 99 in there and came back out, I see, look at the CSV file, okay, so now I know this is the category to create this mapping. So that's when we got like the conceptual understanding of categories, category options, whatever. So now it's just a task. Well, I shouldn't say just, but it, it's 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 a task of constructing the mapping. We didn't have we had very clean data, so we didn't have much data cleaning to do. Um, in terms of the actual application, 
we've gone through a couple different versions. One, we just had an R script, which, you know, was relatively easy. Now we have, well, then in the end, we had like a R shiny. I don't know if you're familiar with like R shiny application where we figured out, we had to figure out there were five or six different formats that all of our data would be in. So we build this application that we upload and it detects if it's one of these five or six and it looks at the correct mapping table and it gives us back a CSV file. Um, I think it was fun to do. I don't know. I hope I don't communicate that it was easier than the, you know, I, <laughs> but it, you know, but um, it, it, it was interesting to do it. It wasn't like a trivial problem, but yeah. But we did have cleaned it though, generally. You can just speak. Yeah. Okay, I'm uh, Anakle from Burundi. Uh, thank you the, for a good presentation about collecting data uh, for no communicable disease, communicable disease or other events. Uh, about uh, what we call CARFE. Carfe. Yeah. Is it uh, an application like uh, data visualization? Wait, uh, the agency. That we can set up in the DHS too, or is another instance? And for me, is very important if we, it is in D, our DHS too, so that uh, we can use to collect uh those that are about uh, no communicable disease like hypertension like uh, diabetes like uh, cancer uh, because in my country we have a, a big problem to collect those data we need your support <laughs> or experience to well, do that thank okay. you all right so all right kafa kafa is the name of our agency so i'm the non communicable there's someone in the audience who is in our um, non-communicable disease surveillance um, group. Um, so I don't know, Heather, I don't know if I'm... So he's asking about non-communicable disease surveillance, hypertension, and, and, and stuff like that. So... But possibly in the interest of yeah. time, is it Dr... Yes, no, I'm sure. Maybe you guys can connect yeah, with the Caribbean Health Agency. They support, I don't know how many, but it's a yeah. Caribbean member state. So it's like a regional, yeah. sub regional organization. Um, but I would also. But we do have not. Point, yeah, we have some tools uses, but, as yeah. well. Uh, DHI has two tools for, for hypertension, um, for cancer registries. So CARFA has used something that they also collaborated on with um, HISPRWANDA. Um, so there are some some good designs and tools as well if you're looking for um, how to implement some of the, the NCD, better improved NCD monitoring in, in your country system. I think we can connect uh, over coffee breaks and lunch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so very much, Darren. Uh, I found it really impressive how much you guys are able to be responsive to your member states and their needs um, while also still having concepts like standards. And, and I have to say, we all think that you've made this sound very easy, but um, I'm sure that was not true. <laughs> so uh, our last presentation before lunch, um, very honored to have my, my good colleague, Dr. Eng Chu, who also serves as our um, primary liaison for the WHO Collaborating Center. Uh, she's with the Division of Data and Analytics and Impact for delivery, delivering impact, DDI. I always get it wrong. I always have to Google it. And I actually do, in fact, write this probably once a week. So uh, Aang has been a fantastic uh, partner and liaison for us, particularly around um, how to set up really strong, integrated routine health information systems. And what is it that we can do at DHIS2 and among the 70 ministries of health that use DHIS2 um, to help support these data standards. So over to you, An. Thank you, Rebecca. This is very challenging because it's the last presentation before lunch. Mm -hmm. So before I um, start my uh, series of pictures, um, does any of you here says work or have heard of the routine health information system toolkits? Great, I can do something that is brand new <laughs> since this been so 
Yeah, so um, that is part of my work. Um, so we are in the, uh, the data, what we call in short is data divisions, where we look at practically three main areas. One is on all the, um, the data products. So the global estimates, the, glo the, the World Health Statistic reports, the SD SDG monitoring. But then part of that, we also look at what is underneath it to bring the data to those reports. And that is part of my work, um, supporting country to strengthen the health data systems, um, specifically on the routine facility-based um, health information systems. And then another part of the work also of the department also look at the ICD, the International Classification of Disease Standards, and of that is now the ongoing ICD-11, but also the whole groups of other standards that come with that. Come with that. Um, we also have a um, what we call the um, the the WHO. I'm still struggling to get the name WHO World Health Data Hub, which is the web page where all the data coming in and the global observatory of all the health data and indicators are also in that. Um, and then another part is delivery for impact, which is supporting country to identify the priorities, identify targets and how to um, how to sort of plan that and then monitor the target to make sure that you know it meets um, the national priorities. So this is what our missions are, just so very quick. Um, and this is some of the key products, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm sure this, like, this is something that's coming up every year, especially around May when the World Health Assembly is, um, uh, is um, happening, which has just passed. This is what the focus of what we are doing and what is the linkage to the DHIS team. Um, and in the past few days, we also hear lots about the smart data, um, the fires, but also... Um, the data quality. But one of the things that I think we need to highlight more, which is it passed a lot on the conversations on the corridors and also a lot of our work, which is the data use. And that is the main product. Um, so what we would like to focus is what is the data we need? What do we need it for? Who is using them? And how we work together to have it happen. My personal mission would be to see at some point um, when we have the world statistic report, we have the global estimates, we would have a number of countries in there where they actually the country data is used either for the reporting or as part of the source of the estimates. At the moment, that has quite a limited number. I'm just giving you an example. The very famous, the, the excess mortality estimate that was published um, last year due to COVID. 72 countries didn't have any data. So the team had to do a lot of modeling and estimate to get the excess mortality. And that actually triggers a very high commitment and interest from all ministries to, some, to strengthen the collection of mortality. But do we really need to have a, that serious event to trigger something like that. And I think it should be something that we work together and bring the data on the global table so that the data you submitted to WHO will be accepted because of the quality, because of its completeness, and that it will be used for all the global estimates and the reporting. And that would be the mission I think WHO alone cannot do and myself cannot do, but it's a coordinated work that we need to do together. And this is where I am, otherwise, you know, like, on the work that the regions has done is fantastic and I don't have to do anything because uh, all the supporting for countries there. But if we can try to find a way to work together and bring that target, it's not about how much data we collect. It's about we collect the right data and we use it at the right place at the right time that we get the right response when there is an a early warning of the outbreaks that the, the facility manager is able to make sure that the services are, are ready for whoever coming in and we know our targets and we can report. It's not just for reporting, it's the use of the data is important. So far, we have a quite an increasing number of programs in WHO's interested in this initiative. 
it's not that easy because the old habit is we want data, we have a fund, we set up a collection systems, we report all of that, and then whatever happened, it doesn't matter anymore. What we're trying to bring here is to minimize number of, uh, of reporting of data that country have to report, to reuse it at country level, but to bring the data together for more of a, what I call it is integrated analysis dashboards. I'm just giving an example. If we have a facility at primary health care level that can have a number of beds they have, number of staff they have, how many people coming to the facility on a daily basis, what are the main reasons they come for the facility? How many have to refer? It? How many of them are treatment uh, get um, are treated? How many of them die? If we have that number on a monthly basis, and if we have enough um, essential medicines, um, commodities in the facility, and how well we use them, do we we can we get um, stock up when we run nearly run out of them? These are the what is important, and we do not need to set up a lot of system because what we have collected so far can fit in that if we put it into the same place. And this is that's what the whole toolkit and package is about. It's not about just the, the the program collecting the data, but sharing the data. And this has been quite a challenging mission because, you know, we always have a, somebody who wanted something else, and it's harder to convince ministry to say, oh, we have a, this funding, but can we also bring it into a pop up into a already something we have instead of setting a new one? And I think Govan and Gabby together with um with um the the, the DHIS2 team have done a fantastic job of proving that this can be changed. And that's what we've been together as a collaborating center for the last six years on this journey. Um, so these are the list of programs that are coming in. Normally what we do is we work together as a WHO teams and we're trying to standardize the metadata, trying to avoid all the duplication of data, make sure that the same data elements are collected, are sharing exactly the same um, the same the definitions, and, and that is used across the data. One of the biggest challenges you have had is age groups when you do aggregate data. But then this is when, you know, the, the DHIS or the digital um, tool coming in didn't help in a way of how we can easily calculate or, or do the grouping without having to change a lot of form. Um, we just did a very recent um, studies and 30% of the time that the health facility staff at the primary health care levels are actually spending on reporting. Just reporting, and they and very few of them would have actually used a report. So I think we also need to change that the data used at the facility by the by the health workers, um, and that would make a lot in terms of strengthening the data quality. And this is a, this is where the HIS to come in, and this is a very good summary of what we have done and all the things that we've done behind it. Is we have this dashboard that demonstrates all the work that we done together from the um, the how we collect the data, but also all the dashboards um, that we can see, you know, if one person can see a different programs that related to the work on the same place, I think that the colleague from CAPA, that is exactly why it's so easy to convince people because it makes the work visible. That means, you know, they are acknowledged and being seen by all different level of, of the health system, but also by the ministers and, and, and the parliaments. And, and that makes them you know, see that they have a value in what they are doing. And I think it is really important of bringing that work that they are doing and being seen as much as possible. And by doing that, it's just not make the data collection more complete, but you know, so they care more about what they report and hence the data quality and the data use. And I have to say, this is a this is not something that you know the WHO HQ can do alone. I think we contribute thirty percent of this. The rest are with partner with Rebecca's and the DHIS two team, the his team, the regional teams. You know who are trying to bring the concept into supporting the countries and the country teams, and also with partner in the country team and the ministry of translating and adapting all of this into what we see in many countries in the work in the, with the DHIS too. Um, but one of the things that I would like to see and we need to do more is 
apart from implementation, what we learn from that? Uh, what are the challenges? What are the the advantages or the the things that we can we can scale up or we can duplicate? And I think some of the work we have started with CDC on learning from the immunization program, learning on some of the of the surveillance program, and to see what works, what are the gaps that is um, that is still there, why it make the, the the implementation so challenging. And one example is the work on. Um, the advert, no, advert events of the after immunization. So we had that work together with the CDC team of trying to see why is it so challenging to implement it, and we ended up having a um, to write a implementation guide or operation guide to make sure that you know all the steps that has been missed in those implementations are repeated and then documented and make it as a guidance so for the implementation. And now it's um it's part of the um the actually the surveillance operational guidance for that. Just a quick update on we have just launched three months ago the strategy for optimizing health information system a routine health information system and come with that is a resource but also some of the of the paper on to address partners on you know how to um, support and mobilize funding in the country. Um, and this is not about data collection. A lot of it is about we put it data use as a center of the document um, and how the data system can work together to support and strengthen the data use. And another part that has been missed out a lot. You know, so this is one of the parts that I think it has been come up of a few in a few presentations and, and in this week. But I think that is something we need to shape it further, which is the enabling factor of enabling to share data, to bring country data into the same place as for the regions, but also across different programs, um, having a standard procedure. So the data governance is one of the part of that that we also highlight in these documents. Um, and then for this toolkit, another lesson learned, so we have the implementation guide, where if country wanted to, um, to uh, start using this, you know, what are the steps and making sure that the, the engagement of the stakeholders and have the leadership in the government is very important. Um, and interestingly, we also work together with the um, the, the team here in Oslo. Uh, so we have a, in the implementation guide, the readiness assessment that is very much of mapping and aligned with the DHIS to maturity assessment. So we would have the continuity of what we start and how we continue and what are the gaps that we have to fill in. And one of the core function, which is the um, the foundation part, is very much the same. And this also some of the the concept of how we work together. And then back to what Ruchita present, the score is a whole picture that also what um that's my unit is doing, which is um we look at this two area. One is the global assessment as a snapshot of the capacity of health information system in the countries. Um. So we are going to launch the second round in September this year, and we plan to have it as a survey for three months. And hopefully by next year, we'll have a, a report coming out to looking at the progress, but also important is what the COVID in between have made change in the data systems in country. Um, and then the second part of the score, which is, all the document that's supporting it. Um, so we would have the, all the resources, the, um, the the tools and standards, the data quality, but also other partners and, and some of the key guiding documents as a, a, um, a, a resources for country. When you identify your priority, your gaps, how we can use those materials to strengthen in addressing this gap and working with partners on that. And I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Anyone have any burning questions for Aang? So if not, we'll go ahead and close this session. I had to actually change the name of the session a couple times to figure out how do I actually adequately uh, describe what we're trying to bring here. But I just want to say on behalf of his center and his network, we are just incredibly, incredibly grateful to have such incredible health partners uh, working with us to support countries, to support country needs. 
And I think if I'm able to now just summarize what is what is our health uh, partner perspectives around the use of DH, uh, DHIS2. And I think it is pretty clear it is all about data use and helping that to occur in countries to make this possible and to achieve things like universal health coverage, reduce communicable disease outbreaks, and really have good health outcomes. So you are all free to go to lunch. And uh, thank you so very much for being here today.